lucky to be here tonight. My wife will attest to this. I woke up this morning with no voice, and uh, of all days, but uh, I've been popping lozenges and everything I can. So hopefully I make it through the whole presentation. And hopefully you'll enjoy it and you'll learn an awful lot uh, about the history of the Marvel Fire Department and uh, even some history before that. Uh, it's been uh, Paul Paul Wasik, who's one of our trustees here, a member at the Society, and a retired fireman, and was a historian of, I guess you could say, of the Marvel Fire Department. Most of the stuff comes from his files, his pictures, what have you. And then uh, Deputy Chief Ron Ayotte, uh, did from 1990 to the present history for us. So I'd like to thank both those. When we put out the calendar this year, we were, as always, under the gun to get it out and uh, tight for space. And I never got to thank them in, that, in the calendar, which I'm, I have to apologize to them for. I'm very sorry for that, but it was crazy, crazy. Anybody that knows what it takes to put those things together, deadlines and what have you. So. Uh, I want to thank him publicly here tonight and on cable. This is being taped on cable to let you know. So we're going to give you the history of the fire department from 1855 to 2013. Uh, and uh, I think you'll find some interesting things along the way here. Prior to 1831, <coughs> fighting fires was done by the Buckets Brigade, if there was water available. And I say that seriously because that was the big problem back then. You know, they were dug wells and, and uh, they had buckets that went down them and they'd have to put the bucket down the well, bring it up, get the bucket, hand it to someone. And it was a bucket, something similar to this here, like this here, a leather bucket, like this. And, uh, and then you can see another one over there that's made of tin or, or whatever it's made of, but you see it's rounded on the bottom and they were rounded on the bottom for a reason, because if you were in the bucket brigade, you couldn't put it down on the ground to take a break, because it would tilt and tilt over. It wasn't square on the bottom, so there was a good reason. So prior to 1831, this is who the thousands of people that fought fires this way <laughs> saved a lot of lives, a lot of fires, and what have you, over the years prior to 1831. Uh, and as I said, if there was water available. 1831, there was a uh, pumper acquired for the uh, West Village, which is up here where we are. Basically, the West Meeting House, which is still on Pleasant Street, uh, was uh, where they held uh, the West Villages, held all their services and meetings and so forth. And a deacon, Philip Phelps, from there, spearheaded the drive to raise $250 to buy. Now, this is not the pumper, because we have no pictures from 1831, but this is what it probably would have looked like, just like this here. This is an 1831 pumper right here. And then three years later, the East Village said, and Feltonville, which now we know as Hudson, said, well, if they could do it, we could do it too. So they bought similar pumpers uh, then. Uh, in 1834. So they could be able to fight fires now. You know, big, big difference. 1849, the town meeting, Marble was still a town back then, you've got to remember. We didn't become a city till 1890. Uh, voted to purchase three new pumpers that could draw water from a pond or a cistern. Uh, they were bought from the Howard and Davis Company of Boston, and uh, they played a very important role for the next few years. Here's one of them uh, called the Torrent, which uh, Paul Paul Wasik and other people bought and restored. And Paul still has it in his, his ownership and doing more restoration to it. So we brought, he, they br brought it back to Marlboro. This is the original one from back then, this Torrent. Uh, these type of uh, pump uh, places, they, they had a suction type pump which could draft water from a pond or a cistern like that. This eliminated the slow bucket brigade. Then uh, they would pump it out, and it came with holes and everything, and they could shoot the stream of water quite a distance. So this really sp sped up being able to fight the fires. And so they, the town purchased 
the uh, three of them, but they left it up to the townspeople to find a place to house them and to man them. So they formed three companies, and they found housing for the three new pumpers and the three engine companies. The first one being the Torrent Company Number One, and this was housed down on Main Street. This, these buildings are no longer here. Some of you old-time marble people will remember this building here as Cedar Lawns. Okay, uh, Joan Abshire, who was used to be one of our trustees and worked on our calendar in 2010 edition, had this picture in and she superimposed Paul's torrent into the picture. So you see the torrent there like it probably was back then, you know. And this was uh, owned by Sylvester Buckland, who's the father of the uh, fire department. He owned this complex here. and. Uh, he let them use the barn. See the door right here? So this would have been housed inside there, like that. Uh, so as I say, now, right now, the new road goes right down through there. So, uh, but for those of you who've been around a while, will remember Cedar Lawns, I'm sure. The, uh, the second company, uh, I always have a hard time with this one, Okama Kamasset better known as Oko, <laughs> that's the easiest way. It means uh, the town of many hills. It was an Indian word that meant the town of many hills. Here's where the firehouse was. Today's Pleasant Street Fire Station's right here. This is Chestnut Street right along there, and this is Pleasant Street along here. This building is still there, they're renovating it. Now, this has gone completely. And of course, the fire house is gone. But that's where it was located. Uh, Louis Fry, who was one of the Fry Boot family, he was the head foreman of that uh, of that company. And uh, the uh, same thing with Torrent. I should go back to Torrent. So Vesta Buckland, who let them use that place, he was the uh, chief engineer of that company, and also. Uh, members of the engineers, there were three engineers that year for that company and uh, one of them was Samuel Boyd, who we know is the father of the city of Marlboro. He owned the biggest shoe factory in the country at the time and uh, the other one was uh, a fellow named Elbridge Howe, who was a, uh, ended up owning Howe Lumber, if some of you might remember Howe Lumber, but he was a builder of houses. Uh, he had gone out to Texas. He built the first wood frame house in Texas. And uh, he went out there because of his uncle, Aza Brigham, who was uh, moved from Marlboro at an early age out to Texas and was part of the revolution out there and became their first treasurer and, and was a signer of the, their, their Declaration of Independence uh, from Mexico. So uh, there's some people that were really involved with the city knew how important it was to have a fire department, as you can see, a builder of houses, the owner of the biggest shoe factory, Louis Fry from Fry, uh, Fry Boots, Fry Shoes, was, uh, was the foreman of this company here. So they knew the importance of it. The third was over in Feltonville. Again, Feltonville is what it was called prior to Hudson. When it broke off in 1866, it became Hudson. We have no idea where, Paul, do you have any idea where that might have been located? Somewhere on uh, Lower Main Street, right there, Felton above Street. Wood Square. Oh, up by Wood Square, so there you go. It was probably in that general area, but we have no records of exactly where it was. Uh, Actually, it's where McDonald's is. Oh, right there. Okay. 1860. Oh, okay, good. There's someone that knows. That's good. Anybody knows any answers, please answer them like that. That's great. In 1852, the Spring Hill Meeting House burnt to the ground, and they had to rebuild it. Uh, uh, it was one of the first major fires in the city back in 1852. That on the other, other side of town? The Spring, the spring uh, it's, you know where the town common is, down on Main Street? Yeah. It's the big white church right up the top of it today. That's where the Spring Meeting House, Spring Hill, that's Spring Hill, they call that Spring Hill. 
They, uh, 18, even as early as 1852, before it was an official fire department, they would hold uh, civic uh, balls and, you know, grand firemen's civic ball. And you can see they did it in, whoops, in 1852. And also they did it again in 1859. And maybe other times. I'm, I, I probably should, uh, before I go any further, is to let you know that the great fire of the city hall in 1902 we lost many, many records, many, many. We're fortunate to piece together some old town reports. I found the oldest town report I was able to find was 1858, and you know they're scattered different because we lost so many records in uh, that fire, great fire in 1902. So that's why it's very hard to come up with information. We have to get it from wherever we can. Uh, and we were able to find Paul, I should say, was able to find I was him. very young then. Yeah. yeah. Paul, was, Paul was at the dance. He was the grandmaster. <laughs> That's why he's hiding back there. He doesn't want to show his age. 1855, thanks to the efforts of 87-year-old Sylvester Buckland, the Marble Fire Department was formed with a board of engineers and a call force of 87 men. And this is why he was named the father of the fire department from that, from doing all that work he did, from let, letting them use his, uh, his real estate and so forth. So uh, he was uh, quite an indi individual. He's, uh, he's buried down on Rock Lawn Cemetery. Does everybody know where Rock Lawn Cemetery is? Yeah, it's, and it's on Stephen Street when you just come off of East Main. First cemetery on the right, the old, the old part, not the new part, but the old part. His father's also there, uh, Samuel Boyd is there, a lot of uh, prominent people, marble people are buried in that cemetery. In 1859, the uh, Eureka 3 replaced the one over in Hudson, the Hydraulic, and, and the department had six engineers, 160 men, and Chief William Frost. They only had two fires that year. Now that's marble and Hudson, it's a big land area, you gotta remember. And they had a payroll of $387, which was mostly for call firemen. That's what they were back then, were call firemen. There wasn't any real structure where they were getting paid, uh, were full-time firemen at that time. In 1860, they were able to acquire the first uh, hook and ladder truck. Um, uh, and I don't think you called it a truck back then. What would you have called it back then, Paul? He doesn't know. Anyways, in 1860, uh, the, uh, they were able to buy this, uh, this ladder. We'll show you a picture of it afterwards. But, um, and they housed it. They built this firehouse, which was right next to the Immaculate Conception Church on Prospect Street, right here. This later on, a few years later, got moved down to Liberty Street. But this is where they housed the, the hook and ladder. So they had hose companies that just had the hoses that they brought to the fire with the pumpers and so forth. And then they had the hook and ladder that they used the ladders to get up the higher, you know, second floor, that type of stuff. Because there weren't many high rises back in 1860. There were a few buildings that might have been th uh, four stories, five stories tops, but uh, most part they were just two story, two and a half story buildings. In 1866, Hudson breaks away from Marlboro. The department consisted of four companies, 218 men, six engineers, a payroll of $872, and that year they had five fires. And I stress all this because you're going to see the big difference when I get up to the present time. Yeah. Uh, and they asked the town, the first, this was the first time they asked, to appropriate $1,000 to build reservoirs. Because that was one of their biggest problems, was they'd get run to a fire and they couldn't fight the fire because there was no water. There was no water whatsoever in a lot, of, a lot of spots. The only thing that really saved them from massive fires back in the early 1800s, for instance, was that there weren't many houses like there are today or structures. Main Street alone, I think, uh, eight, ten structures maybe on Main Street back then, and they were spread apart. You know, they weren't like all clumped side, like we are today, side by side by side. So when you have a fire today, you run, you know, the risk of the next on both sides catch them too, you know. So they didn't have that back then, so. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. They had a lot of things going against them too, you know. But uh, it, uh, it didn't uh, 
you'll see later on about the great fire in Boston. I mean, they were all right next door, right up to each other, and, and bad wind, a fire starts, bang, uh, 300 structures burnt in a matter of a day. So, um, in 1867, saw three new uh, buildings for the city hose companies, to, for the two hose companies and the hook and ladder. That's when they moved the hook and ladder down and they built two other new structures for them. And in 1871, the Veterans Fire Association was organized. They actually, the veterans from the department organized this and they had eventually would have their own engine and so forth and they would go fight fires, the veterans would. They went to part of the regular fire department, but they had their own veterans association and they would fight fires. Here's the great fire of, of uh, Boston in 1873. Uh, Barbara uh, went there to aid them there. They stood by, they weren't right in the city itself, they stood by and what they did was they transported the wagons on the railroad so they could get there faster. They took the railroad, they took the, the wagons and they put them on flatbeds or whatever, uh, cars, railroad cars, and brought them in. But they weren't right in fighting. They were on standby, backing them up. As, as we say here, it's probably the beginning of mutual aid. It's the first time that I could find in the records that we have that uh, they went to help someone else out with a fire. So, in 1873, Three, there was still no action by the town for water. You know, and they, the engineers recommend building cisterns. Uh, Joan Abshire, uh, one of our former trustees that helps us put this together, actually found a picture of a cistern right here, as you can see. And uh, so there was still a major problem because of no water. In 1874, they had four companies plus the Veteran Fire Association. They had 128 men, $3,069 in payroll. They purchased a chemical engine. Uh, if you've got any questions on that, Paul can answer those <laughs> better than I can. Uh, and they started a new company called the Babcock, which had, was a chemical engine. It was stationed with the veterans engine on, we think, Lincoln Street. Because some of the reports we read call a station up on Gay Street. So we have a feeling that back in 1874, they probably were in some structures on Lincoln Street, but the structure was probably in the middle of between Gay and Lincoln, so a lot of people called it either Gay or Lincoln at the time. But they, they had built a firehouse there when the, uh, for the Veterans uh, Fire Association. And so when they started this new uh, Babcock, which was with the chemical engine, they went in there with them. Can you explain the chemical engine, what it did? It's, uh, they had two tanks on there and they used to mix like a, like a soda and acid or soda and water, which would create a pressure like uh, if you mixed up uh, like some Drano with water and it creates a reaction and it created the pressure which would allow to be used on a possible oil or electric fire as opposed to using water on them, you, you wouldn't uh, but they mixed up two chemicals together and it created, it created like combustion and caused the pressure and allowed them to use that on a fire that they, you would normally not use water on. You see here, fire police. They had their own police. The fire department uh, talked to the town and the town approved it and they had their own fire police, they were called. They would show up at a fire because they were, firefighters were having a problem at some of the fires with unruly men, probably drunk, whatever, trying to get in, get in their way, and things like that. So they had their own police, fire police it's called. But as you're gonna see pretty soon here, it didn't last too long. In 1875, they finally got some reservoirs and wells put in. Uh, you can see here, uh, of east side of Church Street, uh, uh, Felton and Chippen, that's, that was a shoe factory. The brick store, that's where the uh, Cedalons was. That's, they called it the brick store back then, corner of Main and Bolton and so forth. Boyd and Corey, which was Sam Boyd's, which was the biggest shoe factory in, in, in 
the United States at the time. It took up all across the street from uh, the old fire station on Main Street where Vin Vin is there now. Uh, it took up that whole side. It was f five stories high and uh, it went all the way down Howe Street way in the back. It was huge. Uh, Cork Street was is today Essex Street. In the late 1800s they changed a lot of, they had uh, a lot of old names that they changed to different, uh, uh, like I say, Cork Street into Essex and so forth. They also renumbered at that time too, uh, re, uh, did a complete re renumbering of the, of the houses and buildings. So this tells you like where they were located, what the capacity is. Now, that sounds all well and dandy, but these things could dry up awfully fast. So they could come to a fire there on, on Cork Street, let's say, and get there and find that uh, that 1,760 gallons is not there. <laughs> it's all dried up. It's just a dried up hole. So they never knew. You know, you had dry seasons and so forth, and they were always hoping that it would rain every so often to fill them up, but they were, a lot of them would dry up. So a lot of times they didn't. But some of them were pretty good and stayed, you know, had water in them most of the time. Uh, you can see the fire police did not last too long, uh, but what they did was the uh, police, the police department was formed just around then, and uh, they gave, the police department gave them uh, the names of the police officers and how to get a hold of them, and, and when there was a fire, the police officers would come. Old Torrent Number 1 restored. Uh, that's uh, some fellows down in uh, Mechanics Street down at the uh, Monument Square. Two individuals uh, took it on because it was sitting, it had been retired and another one brought in. And uh, now this is the one that you own today, isn't it, Paul? Yeah. yeah. Uh, they restored it and they opened up their own station house there. They did all this with their own money, these two fellows. And they restored it and they opened up another uh, company, I guess you could say. In 1877, there was a fire at the T.A. Coolidge Shoe Factory on Howland Street. Uh, the building is still standing there today in its condominiums. It doesn't look anything like this. This is what it looked like back in the 1800s. And uh, that burnt, there was a, a major fire there, total lost $75,000, which was a lot of money back in 1877. And uh, they rebuilt it to, the exact same, as you can see, the roof lines here, everything. This was uh, some industry, I think it was Austin Industries, I think it was, that was in there. And uh, then, as I said, it finally got sold and converted into condominiums. I think it uh, has yellow side, if I remember right. So uh, You'll see all the major fires that we had in the city in this presentation. Uh, that we have records of. So in 1884, they finally got waterworks built in the city. They finally got it done, which was tremendous help. And they had 37 miles of underground pipe with 227 hydrants coming from a large man-made reservoir atop Sligo Hill. At that time, the fire chief was someone named John C. Rock. They had five companies with 275 men. Again, most of those were call. Uh, back in this era, the only times that were full-time people where uh, firemen were the drivers. They always wanted to make sure that they got there first to the, and then the, all the other firemen would come to the fire. They had to live in the firehouse, the drivers. They lived there 24 hours. They did get time off every so often. They got a couple weeks vacation and so forth. And probably around this time, they were making maybe three to $500 a year, the drivers were. Call firemen were probably getting ten, fifteen dollars to answer a fire, somewhere around there. They had thirty fires that that year, so you can see how progressively it starts getting more. Because now marble's starting to build up. We got a lot of shoe factories. Rice and Hutchins was a shoe factory at uh, at Palmetto Square. That's the one that they took just took down for the bank, TD Bank North. Remember the building that used to be there? That's where th this was here, the Corey Block. We know the Cory Block is a brick building today, but it was a wood structure. This thing must have had three, four fires in it over the years. It kept having fires. And the J.B. Bill and Shoe Factory. 
also on Main Street, which would have been up by, let's see the best way to describe it to you, up by where the senior center is. There was a shoe factory there. So uh, as you can see, so it's gone up uh, to 30 fires from two. It's gone up to 30. Uh, also, uh, that year, Marble lost its first fireman to die in duty. First engineer, he was one of the engineers, Charles Witherby. Uh, he was fighting a fire on Florence Street. It was a dye house. I forget the name of J.B. Gettys or something like that, dye house, on Fairmont Street, which wasn't too far off of Maine. He fell from the roof of a, this is the way they describe it, roof of a piazza, and he broke his left wrist and damaged his spine. About five days later, they had to uh, cut off his hand, his left hand, because I don't know what happened, but something happened to it. And uh, about 10 days later, from the spine, the spine injury was so bad, he, he passed away from the spine injury. He could not recover. So he was the first fireman to really die in duty on the job. You know, he, it was a, what I think they said, it was 15 feet that he fell from the, the roof of the piazza. In 1885, they went under a complete reorganization with new engine and hose companies with 50 and 20 men each, plus a ladder company that had 35 men. In 1887, a new fire alarm was finally installed, but it didn't cover the entire town. Uh, also, the Prospect Street uh, station was, had been moved to Liberty Street. Is the... Uh, the uh, the hook and ladder one that got moved. This is on Liberty Street now. This was the one that used to be up on Prospect Street. And uh, this is the Chief's buggy. But it shows you the first time they started using horses. Up until then, they would, guys would drag it, you know, pull it like from the things and drag them to the, to the uh, fires. So they started using horses to speed it up. Go so, back one slide. Go back one slide. Okay, on this, when they reorganized, they had, they had hose wagons. And um, the bad. reason that they, we didn't have steamers here is because we had the static pressure from this lake that was up there on Stevens Park um, gave us enough pressure through the hydrants that we didn't have any steamers in Marlboro. Hudson had steamers, didn't have as many hills over there and, uh, as we have here. So we were lucky in a way not to have to purchase mm -hmm. A steamer, which is a whole lot more expensive than a hose wagon, and um, the um, and a lot of the underground piping when it was first put in was wooden. Mm, that's right. Yeah. And um, yeah. they would take three or four foot sections of a tree and hollow out the center and wedge it into the larger section of the next tree, and the water would flow down the line and up out of the ground on probably a wooden hydrant of some sort. But um, Even now when they're digging, they when the city it. is digging uh, in certain areas, they pull up a piece of old wood wooden pipe, pipe yeah. along with cobblestones. Yeah. And it seems really funny that uh, where the cobblestones were and where the streets were is now probably about uh, <laughs> six, maybe eight feet under the surface now of what we're driving on. Yeah. So you can imagine how much the roads have changed and the height of the roads. Yeah, a lot of the main street, for instance, you'll see some pictures of the fire at the court. Uh, Florence Street went like Right that, down the hill, right yeah. Right down the hill off of Main Street back then. And Main Street rose a lot more drastically than it does now. If you stood up at Monument Square, you're kind of looking downhill. People don't realize that, but you do, so. Uh, Marble was famous for their white horses that they, they had uh, for the fire department. It was white horses, most of them. This was a fire in 1889, a major fire at the Phoenix Block on Main Street. Now, I'm going to tell you where this was. This was the Fairmont Building. Everybody knows where the, uh, where the, uh, uh, this is, would be uh, Newton Street right here. Some of you that have been around for a while would remember Anderson that was the Anderson Furniture. furniture. Of course, not then, but it ended up being Anderson Furniture in here. They built another building a couple stories high because this was a total loss here. Uh, they called it the Phoenix Block at the time. The danger that they had back then was building collapse, more so than 
uh, the smoke. Uh, we we made a, a problem when we introduced plastics into everything, and uh, that's more deadly than any of this wood burning or hay burning. And that uh, uh, you know, so back then most of their their fears were you know building collapse on top of the man or falling off a piazza, or getting run over by a horse on the way to the fire. All right, this is where the signal boxes were, the location of signal boxes. Paul tells me that that number 23 was probably the one called in the most. Is that correct? Which Connor one? Broad and Lincoln? No, 28. 28, oh, 28. I thought Connor Lincoln, Lincoln and mechanic. mechanic. Just down the street, another big corner. And also, which one? Did they have one up on uh, Broad and Chestnut and Broad? Uh, we were forever going up there for uh, brass That must fires. have come along later. Yeah. So how, how did the signal boxes identify themselves when they came into a fire center? They came through the, the, uh, that big game well system that's in the front lobby at Central Fire. And it worked on a, a system that I couldn't even tell you how it works, but it calculated a breaker, like a... Yeah. a Cold yeah, wheel, yeah. and it would break the signal, and then when it would come through there, it would it had um, uh, this this unit that's down there. A little flag would come down and tell you what circuit it was coming from, and then it would tap out a number, and you would see what your number was. And of course, when they first started using the whistle, it would blow the whistle automatically, and then you know most of when we were hanging around the station. God, I knew almost every box without having to look it up. But uh, now that I'm 184, I can I, I can't, I say, can't remember. <laughs> I can't quite remember all of them now. But moving right along, 1890, Marble became a city. In 1890, had one major fire that year. That would be fire, uh, Forest Hall, uh, which is this is Lincoln Street and Winthrop Streets over here. Today we know this as the Lofts. It became marble wire goods. You can see the other, the original part of wire goods just over here to the right. See the windows there, like that. And this used to be there. It was a big hall. They they used to hold boxing matches, basketball games, all <coughs> kinds of things up there, entertainers, uh, different things like that. Uh, and the uh, a lot of unions met there. Back in the, this era, most of the buildings in downtown or up Lincoln Street and so forth had halls. All of them did, it, it, and they'd have all kinds of different functions and things going on there. So that was the major fire when Marble turned to, into a city. Uh, in 1891, all apparatus became horse-drawn, all of them. So they had five horses, five firehouses, 64 men. The major fire was at the John O'Connell Shoe Factory on Howe Street, which seemed to have a lot of fires, which you'll see later on. Uh, this factory is where the uh, Marble Savings Bank new building is now. Here's where the John O'Connell factory used to be, right on Howe Street. In uh, 1891, their own fire station burnt down. This was Hose Company number one. This was the original downtown fire station. It was on Bolton Street. Uh, the Today's fire station that we know would be over here, and Main Street would be down in here someplace, and this is Bolton Street like that. This originally had a tower, a big tower. They all had towers so they could hang their hoses to dry. And they all had these very tall. Uh, and the only place we've seen that picture is we have a picture of uh, the house across the street from uh, the Dairy Queen back in this, even before this, uh, that shows you can see the tower of this building in the background uh, of that house. So uh, this got destroyed but they rebuilt it and they used it for another 15 years as a fire station. And uh, you'll see that when we get to the newer one. In 1894, the fire alarm got a system wired for 10 miles, so it kept going farther out, farther out, farther out. And uh, the fire badly damaged what was called the Burke Block you know, on Main Street. This would have been where, to the left of this would be Chin's Garden, that you all know, and right here now is a one-story medical building in there right now. So that was there. This was owned by someone named Michael Burke, 
So uh, that was a major fire in 1894. Finally, 1895, the standpipe got erected. There's the reservoir that they were talking about earlier right there. It's still there? So, yeah. So this got, the reason this got built was to increase the pressure because of the increase in shoe factories up on the hill. You had Fry, you had uh, Howe, you had uh, four, about four or five factories up on the hill. And they didn't uh, have the pressure to fight. If something happened to any of those big wooden shoe factories, they would have went up very quickly. So this gave them the pressure into the, the hydrants up there on the hill. And those and that, no. Yeah. no. Is it a field now? Oh, I, it, that'll tell you how long it's been since I've been up there. So that was, that's, you say pressure now, gravity. Yeah, well, they put, pump the water. You know, there's, there's a pumping station down in Lake, Lake uh, William. They pump that up to there, and then it's like, whoosh, comes out. But that, that, uh, that created a high-pressure water system, and it was limited to hydrants around town, and most of them were located near a shoe factory in, in uh, City Hall, and they used to have this, I don't know if we have a picture in this presentation of a high pressure water test where they ran 12 two and a half inch lines with just the static pressure coming down from that tower, and it was squirting water higher than that roof on top of Pleasant Street Station. The tower. Going on. Was that a bell tower or was it for hanging the hoses? That was hanging hoses up in there. I never realized that. It's not, uh, it's not safe up there in the tower. The, the tower, the, it only went just about to about here. <laughs> uh, I, Brian, I, what are you doing? I, I, up to about here, we could hang the hoses in there. There used to be a ladder inside on the brick wall, but it's not, it was safe. It was the, the anchors were pulling out of the wall. And then, and two whistles were installed. One of them is one right of the there. Is over here. Is over there. That's one of them right uh, there. Um, when they refurbished the place downstairs, uh, we had discontinued the use of whistles, and so I took them down from up there before, just before. <laughs> What's that? Oh yeah, no, that was all still there. This is missing now, this small one here in the center. That was, that was the venting for the back where the horses used to go, where they used to drop the... That little piece right there? That's on there still? The flag was never there. The flag was painted in right. Didn't they cap that off right there? They, the small one? They didn't cap that off? This, this one here you're talking about? still there. So anyways... So uh, that 10 minutes to 9. That was a curfew years ago. That was a curfew, yeah. Curfew whistle. Yeah, that was for the stragglers. <laughs> That's the ones who didn't make it at night. <laughs> well, the guy that lived next door there, Adrian Bossy, I, uh, we'd have a fire and the whistle would probably blow a double alarm, and so it was really blowing. And he'd get out in the morning and I says, uh, the whistle keep you up? What whistle? <laughs> so you learn to you learn to shut a lot of things out. Also, in 1895, when they built this, they uh, moved the Union Ladder Company that was down on Liberty Street up into here to be housed with Holes Number no. Two. This was the num Holes Number no. Two Company here, which is probably there's the hook and ladder right there, and there's uh, Holes Number no. Two. And down the right cellar there. was the jail cells. Yeah, the jail. That's right. They, they had the jail cells there, for the police uh, because they had no, uh, no other place to put the prisoners. They had talked about building a police station and a fire station somewhere else other than City Hall, and the cells were in downstairs at City Hall. Uh, but they were talking about it, so they moved them up here because they were overcrowded down at City Hall. So they needed somewhere else. The cells are still down the cellar. There's no doors on them. There's still cells down uh, up at with under Vinbin too. Under there, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, in 1896, you can see how they progressed. 335 hydrants, 29 alarm boxes, seven horses. They still had horses. Five companies, five station houses. Gil Marshall was the chief, and they had 63 men. As I said, uh, some of those were full-time the drivers. The rest were call call uh, firefighters. Uh, 
1897, remember I was saying about the Cory Block, all the different fires and so forth? Uh, this is one of the major fires they had there. This was called the Central House Block. It was actually a hotel, the Central Hotel it was called. And uh, it was like, I think, uh, three or four stories high. And then the Cory Block was right next, next door to it. And uh, all these buildings are gone today. They're all gone. And you can see there was a little forest shop here. This is Florence Street. You can, I don't know if you can tell from back there, that, but the grade, this goes down, dropped quite a bit going down. You um, can also see that uh, Main Street had a lot of houses on it, yeah. residential homes. Residential, yeah. They, they got were mixed squeezed in out eventually. Yeah, they were mixed in between. And on the other side of Florence Street was the uh, train depot, the New York, New Haven train depot. Was on, that went down south, went down through South Pro and so forth into Fayetteville. That was on the other side of this. With a fire like that, there you are, you call, how do you, how do you figure out how to approach it? How, you, how did you guys go about that? Well, uh, yeah, you should know. You were there, weren't you, in 1897? Well, when you come to a fire, you, you, you have to size up the situation. You've got to see what you have. You've got to decide that, you know, Fire's only up there, it's no fire over here, and what do you got for an exposure over here? Do we have the equipment to get to where it is? Should we go inside? Should we stay outside and fight? Um, it's knowledge that comes from within, mostly. I mean, you have to have seated a pants. Um, uh, I don't know, you, you just, you can't learn it out of a book, let's put it that way. You can't go, and, to the academy and say, hey, you know, this we're going to teach you everything you know. You need to have real fear to know what it's all about. And then you were asking about the dropping of, of uh, staffing, we'll say. Uh, a lot of it became, eh, I'm all set. Okay, goodbye. See you later. I'm not giving up my life for that. So, oh, yeah. okay. so you had to have a dedication to become a firefighter. This was the uh, town report of 1897 was the first mention of the Fireman's Relief Association. Do they still have that today? Fireman's? Yes. You do? Okay. Does uh, Reading last a life with that or do not? Really? No. Oh, that's no. Good. They, got, they got everybody out. Uh, matter of fact, a lot of uh, young kids were going through the hotels, uh, getting the people, knocking on doors, getting them out. They got all the people out. I didn't bother putting all that stuff in here, but yeah, it's... Uh, that's, uh, but the next fire, this, uh, this fire was nothing compared to what you're going to see on the next fire. One of the major fires the city ever had. The city's most devastating fire consumed City Hall. Now I'm talking the old City Hall. Not the City Hall you know today, but the old City Hall. This was on Christmas Day, 1902. They used to have a big hall upstairs here. And they had a basketball game there the night before. And I think what happened was someone didn't shut the gas off because everything, gas lights, everything was by gas back then. And I think that's what happened Christmas Eve. Imagine they were having a basketball game on Christmas Eve up there. But this went all day long. Uh, as you can see, it just, what Paul was saying about houses, see the couple houses here right next to where City Hall was, uh, right there. And it just completely destroyed it. And then it, was the old City Hall? This old city hall, yeah. right where the one is right today. Right where the new one is now. Right where the new one is, yep. But that was probably one of the most devastating fires ever. Because, too, to people like us that try to study history and learn history, we lost a ton of records, a ton of old records from the, from the 1600s, 1700s, town, you know, town records and stuff that we would, some of us as historians, would love nothing better than to get our hands on, you know. And they all went up in flames. Anyway, to move right along here, 1904, they had another fire at the Cory Block. Not a major one like the one I showed you before. Of course, they kept rebuilding, rebuilding. Uh, 1905, the fire department, civil service was adopted uh, in 1905, major move there. 1906, the department had 61 men, five frontline pieces, four spare wagons, seven good horses, four station houses and 35 alarm, fire alarm boxes. I take this verbatim out of the, the town report done by the fire engineers. They're the ones that put down here seven good horses and so forth. 
So that was the status of it in 1906. You can see I kind of jumping around because that's all the records that we could find. So I'm giving you that information as of that time. Uh, 1909, March 4th, the old marble theater destroyed by fire. Now, some historians here know where this, where this was. Any have anybody have any idea where this marble theater was? Where? This was on Newton Street, right where the parking deck, parking garage is. It faced out on Newton Street. And that same spot at one time back in the late 1800s into the early 1900s, there was a bowling alley there, there was a theater there, and so forth. But that was completely destroyed by fire in 1909. And then everybody knows the Marble Theater as the one up on Main Street by Monument Square. That's what most of us remember as the Marble Theater. Then, of course, on uh, the Main Street Fire Police Courthouse was built in this year. You can see the old hose, the, the old fire station here, and there's the tower that we're talking about. See the tower there? It doesn't, didn't show up in that other picture we had, but there it is right there. So uh, that other picture we had is uh, 1910, so something must have happened to it in one year. So. Uh, this is a postcard that we have that Paul had. 1910, uh, Marlboro was celebrating its 250th anniversary this year uh, and uh, as a town, because we were formed in 1660. Uh, and they recommended installing motor-driven apparatus. It was a recommendation then. They had three stations at the time. The chief was C.H. Andrews, 61 men, six pieces of apparatus, and four one horse pungs. Everybody's going to say, what the heck is a pung? What is it? Well, a pung is like a, uh, a sleigh. It's like a sleigh. It's the only way to describe it. They would be in the winter time because they had the horses, for instance. So they kept, they kept them just in case. But when they had the horses uh, in the wagon and the horses to pull in the winter time, if there was a lot of snow, they'd put these pungs underneath the wheels. And it turned it into like a sleigh. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Overshoes for a wagon? So, yeah, that's it. Overshoes for a wagon. You got it. So, and quite inter interesting. This is the first time I'd seen anything in all the, since 1858 of uh, this happening. Seven youths arrested for lighting fires. Quite a, quite a few fires, too, that they had lit. So, uh, but that was the first time I came across anything like that. But. I too, when I first saw that, I said, what the heck is a horse pump? You know, uh, once they described it, it made sense, perfect sense. So, uh, 1911, uh, they had a new chief, E.C. Minahan. These were his assistants. This man was Joseph Keene, I think it is, and this man was uh, ba Barry. Barry. Barry, and he went on to be the police chief later on, believe it or not. And, uh, but uh, that was in 1911. 1915, the Masonic block, two, you already, uh, you know, you know what happened later on, which we'll get to, but this was what the Masonic block looked like back then. They had, it was badly damaged by fire uh, back then. And in 1916, the fire whistle was installed in 1916. In February 4th, a cold winter fire destroyed St. Jean, Jean Baptiste Hall at the corner of Lincoln and Broad. This is what it looked like. That's what it looked like after the fire. So you can see what a number it did to it. This is Lincoln Street. This is Broad Street right here, like that. This is Broad Street over here. This is Lincoln Street over here. So this had numerous fires at this site. Even the one that's there now has had one or two fires to it uh, over the years. It's, it's funny how there's three or four locations in the city that have had three, like two, three, four fires at the, that location over and over. 1918, they got their first piece of motorized equipment. It was a 1917 white triple combination truck right here. I'm sure these tires were hard rubber. Uh, no, no? they like balloon tires. They're balloon tires, I was wrong. And that also had chemicals on it. Oh yeah, you can see the right two, two tanks right there. That's why they called triple combination was the ladder and the pumper and the, and the chemical. And water also. They had water on there too, you think? Probably a, a small tank. 
So this was first house down on Main Street, and then they moved it up to Pleasant Street, and they moved the co combination ladder truck up there back down to Main Street. So they juggled uh, equipment around back then. In 1918, uh, there was a big fire at Lake Williams Ice House, which is right there. Dunkin' Donuts is right here. People know where Dunkin' Donuts is on Lakeside Ave. So these people were standing out on the Lake Williams or on the ice. You can see the saw that they had here, the cut ice. There is a chute that goes up, that went up, uh, you can't see it here too well, went up to the ice house. And uh, it's still, day, yeah, they still, tore it up. they tore it up? Yeah, I'll, on the, on the lake side. I'll kill them, yeah. I'll kill them. <laughs> they, uh, there's a chute, they used to have a chute that went under Route 20. And what they would do, they'd cut a slab of ice and it would be only maybe this thick, maybe six inches thick, six, eight inches thick. And they had to shoot that cement. It was cement like it went underneath Route 20 and then it went up the hill. And on the other side of Route 20 over here, they'd have horses and they'd hook up a thing to that sled. It would be like a sled that they put it on. And the horses would go up the hill and drag the slab of ice up to the barn. And up in the barn, they had uh, a lot of uh, sawdust, straw, and stuff like that, and that's what kept the ice co uh, cold in the, during the summer months, the, the warmer months. There, were, there was another ice house over here called People's Ice on the other side, but it would be by the interchange of 495, the southern part of Route 20. That's where the ice house murder, the unsolved ice house murder took place, over here at the one that was on this side. There was also at one time a very small one on the east side of the lake uh, because Route 20 as we know it today comes right up close to the lake <coughs> but you know the the service road or whatever you want to call it up by where Hoods is and Laura and all that that's the original Route 20 so you can see there was quite a wide area there down to the lake uh, way back then in the early 1900s and then they reconstructed Route 20 and brought it closer to, the, to Lake Williams later on. 1919, um, the brush fire raged and spread engulfing the pavilion and buildings at Fairmont Park. Fairmont Park was at the very top of Fairmont Hill, and uh, it was where fire department used to run a lot of musters up there. They used to run uh, vents. Uh, people would have parades, and they'd march up the hill. You know what that Fairmont Hill was like. <laughs> they'd march up the hill, and they'd end up, there's the gates. These are the gates to get up into it. And this was the pavilion up there. It must have been a beautiful view because back then there weren't as many structures and there weren't as many house, uh, many uh, trees, large trees around. So the view must have been really beautiful at the time. But uh, it started a, a, an a, a area where that, that had been used for many events for 12 years. And after that, they never used it again after the, the pavilion got burnt to the ground. So it was, uh, at, for them, a major fire back then. And uh, as I say, the, uh, firemen used to uh, <clears throat> have musters up there because it was like a big open field up there too, even though it was up on top of the hill. Uh, 1921, uh, they upgraded uh, with three new motor trucks and in 1922, they finally received a, a ladder truck that was wanted. Uh, and this is it here. Is it's this the a, one that you almost got? Yeah, it, it, uh, it was used when we got it. Um, Oh, you and, never got it? Well, no, when they bought it years ago. Yeah. And it, it was, oh, when the city bought it. When the city bought it, it was a used truck, and it had hard rubber tires, and it had a right-hand drive, and it had a shifter on the outside on the running board, and let me tell you, it was a job driving that, and I drove that a couple years ago down in Long Island when we went down to look at it. And, <laughs> It was really something, it, and noisy. You could, it's almost like the gearbox had no oil in it. It's just, it well, was amazing. Well, they thought they thought they had What's a. What's the make of that truck? That was American La France. It, it came from so. England, so it's it, that's why it was a right-hand drive. Yeah. And I'm it, sorry and to tell it you. It was 1914 totally restored. American La France. Uh, they thought they had it bought only to find out that someone from out west someplace. The elders, no, the elders of the people who owned it decided it was worth more money and they wanted oh, more money for it. it and uh, 
it kind of fell by the wayside because the, the pr purchase price and the price of shipping it back here from Long Island, um, it needed an escort to go about 30 miles or so back around to the ferry, the ferry ride across to Connecticut. To Connecticut. Uh, and then we could come right up like 395 and um, the cost was quite a bit to do that to get it back here. Would have been nice, there's really no way to put it once we got it here, but I'm sure we could have figured something out. But we did, we lost it and then somebody from I think the Midwest ended up buying it because he's uh, an American La France collector. And money talks and you know what walks. So. Uh, one thing funny that I saw in the uh, town report that year, for the, for the engineer's report, was that now they got motor, you know, new motor trucks and everything. All the citizens were complaining about the fire truck speeding around the city. <laughs> so they, as a result, they posted a 25 mile per hour for fire trucks. No faster than 25 miles per hour. Okay, in 1922, they installed a better sound than whistle. The other thing that the citizens complained about besides the speeding was the whistle all the time. Mm -hmm. Kept complaining about the whistle. Didn't like the sound of it, so they installed a, a better sound than whistle. That year they had two large fires, one at the barn at Rice's Orchards and a storage barn at Howe Lumber. Remember I talked about Elbridge Howe? was one of the, and way back, that was part of the Torrent Company back in the 1850s, and he started Howe Lumber. That's what I was talking about, down on uh, Florence Street, I believe, how lumber was. 1922, August 19, 22nd, 1922, department saddened by the death of C. Henry Boner. It's, hard, it's a tough picture because uh, we didn't have that great a picture to begin with, but uh, C. Henry Boner was the driver for the fire department. He drove everything, all right? And uh, it's what... It's unbelievable how he died. I mean, uh, he was now down station at the, uh, he used to drive the hook and ladder uh, team when they were up on Prospect Street, when they were down on Liberty Street and so forth. This is, uh, actually this picture I believe is on Newton Street at the time. No, it's, that's nope. Liberty. That's Liberty, Liberty and Windsor. Oh yeah, well, Liberty and Windsor, yeah, coming down. And uh, the station would have been over here. but. Uh, he was now down at the fire station, you know, new fire station on Main Street, and it was the first time he was going to be driving the truck, motorized truck, and the alarm came in, he got up, jumped in the truck, drove out the door and had a heart attack and died. Right there on Main Street. So he didn't make it too far in his new job driving the motorized fire truck, unfortunately. But, uh, I guess he was very well liked. Paul knew him well back then when yeah. Paul was working. There. So uh, <clears throat> maybe you could tell us something about him, Paul. I, I, know, I, I know where his grave is up the Icy Cemetery. I make sure there's a flag on it each year from the the Department of Relief Association. But um, he was, I don't know, he was part of the horses, and evidently the strain of losing horses and having to drive a motorized ladder truck was probably just too much for him. It was just his time, I guess, and he wasn't that old. I didn't mm. I check the years. I think he was only like around in his 70s when he passed. Anyway, so now 1923, the department's now totally motorized, but they kept a pair of horses for the old hose pungs. And they did that because the trucks still weren't that great in the winter time. Sure. So they put the pungs under the wheels and they had the horses pull them if they had to, just to make sure they get to it. It was sort of like, this was, this was more of like an insurance policy for them for, during the winter. Uh, they also that year had a 40,000 fire at Moss and Bigelow on Lincoln Street. Moss and Bigelow was the general store of the era. It, uh, they sold everything you could think of here. Everything you could think of. Some of you might know uh, uh, his wife, Ella Bigel, wrote the History of Marlboro in 1910. Uh, he himself was one of the founding members of Marlboro Library. Uh, and uh, they used to have a big house over here that's now the Shell Station. And uh, right now this building is still there, believe it or not. 
It doesn't look anything like this. It has uh, yellow siding, siding on it. This is all sided. And all sided. Right in the corner here, where the driveway is a side of here, it, yeah. there's a tree growing, and it's hanging out into the street. But in August, early in the morning, as the sun's coming up, and it's coming up almost directly up Lincoln Street, before that tree had grown out, I used to come up the street and look, and you could see the rippling siding going over every one of those windows. And mm. If they could cut that tree down, and summer morning you could go up there and you can see the, the lines and say, my God, there's all the windows still. And it's, there's no stores down front, it's all blocked off. All blocked off. Somebody's However, it's we... Still there. It's we still have, there, but it's, yeah. it's hidden underneath all that it's siding. It's hidden underneath. We have a picture of this earlier picture and they have deer hanging out there and, and wild game and stuff that they're selling. But um, Deborah Fairbanks, who did the lofts across the street, is very interested in this building. And she's been inside it, and she said a lot of this is all still there inside. They just sided it on the front and uh, put uh, plaster or whatever up on the inside. And that's after the fire still remains? Oh yeah, the fire was back in 1923. They fixed it over. It was went on for a while longer. On, on the second floor, Space Age. Space it, Age was up was there. Up there for yep. A few months of the yep. It's a big, big and open. Big open area yeah, up there. Open area. So she's presently, I think, negotiating and trying to buy it and would restore it because she's a historic mm -hmm. architect. So she's, uh, it, she would say, she said she would try to restore it to something like this. This is not really a that good a picture of it. If you saw some other pictures, it really was a beautiful building. So, uh, but it was the store, like from maybe eight, for a hundred years probably. I think it was built in around 1820, 1830, somewhere around there. So, 1926, St. Jean Hall again. Remember I said there's two or three buildings always seem to have a fire. They had another fire. Suffers two fires within two weeks. So this is like the fourth fire that they have. You can see it was a big fire. So 1930, Samuel Dulce was the first civil service chief sworn in. That's him right here. He served for 19 years. Big thing he did was change the uniforms to paramilitary light colored khaki, as you can see, all right? Uh, he procured a surplus army truck to fight brush fires. Well, one of the things that he did. Uh, he also procured two 1935 American La France pumpers. And uh, you can see this is a picture. They're in there someplace. I couldn't tell you which one. Two on the right. Two on the right. Yeah. Over here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then he also, in 1944. I can say I did get to drive those when I got oh. on. They still had them. In 1935, you were about 80 years old then. No, 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 but when I still got on the department, they 1944, I was able to drive them. their budget was up to $45,000, included for the chief, made $800 a year. Two assistants, uh, 500 each, that's, that is for a total of 1,000. Superintendent of the fire alarm system made 700. The full-time drivers, you can see that, as I was telling you, full-time drivers, 24,000, and the call firemen, 10,000, some odd hundred. Pensions, the first time I saw any mention of pensions was this year here, 1944. So they put aside $3,200 for pensions in that particular year. 1946, they replaced the old wood floor with new cement floor in Central Fire Station. Because remember, they had horses and they weren't that much weight back then and the, what they had, the wagons they had. Now you've got the big trucks and so forth. They had to replace that and put cement in there. 1948, they acquired a new 85-foot Seagrave aerial ladder truck, as you can see here. And uh, it, uh, let me give you some particulars about it. It was at 150 feet of hose, at a 250 gallons per minute water pump, a 300 gallon tank. And what it did was it eliminated the need for many operators, and it could be operated only by one person. So it freed up the other people to fight the fires. 
to fight the fire, and only one person had to operate it. So it was the very first aerial ladder truck that the city had acquired. That was in 1948. 1949, uh, February 11th, Chief Douse suffers a fatal heart attack. He uh, responds to a fire at 52 Main Street, which is a place called Al's Electric, which was on the corner of Cotton Ave and Main. So you can tell it wasn't very far distance. He came out of the station, he went to the fire, he got out there, he was on the ground directing everybody, and he suffered a, a major fatal heart attack while he was there. Uh, First Assistant Chief Perry O'Leary assumed the duties as the acting chief to take over. So it was about 19 years that he served uh, in office as the chief. In 1950, John Brecken, a veteran of 22 years, was appointed chief in March. Uh, then that in 1950, the chief now has a chief, two assistant chiefs, three captains, 12 permanent drivers, and 50 call firefighters. 51, the department enters a new field called emergency medical training, treatment, I mean, EMTs, as we know them today. So that happened in 1951. They started an auxiliary that, uh, made up of young men to f help fight the grass fires, as you can see here. In uh, 1952, they received two Emerson rest, res I can't even say it, resuscitators. <laughs> Uh, my, uh, I was telling you earlier, Joan Abshire, one of our former trustees, put together the PowerPoint presentation. She's a whiz. How she found this was beyond me. She Googled, went through, and she actually found an original ad for it like that. So uh, in 19, I'm going to go through the 50s here a bit. Over here. Uh, it was an age of advanced automation under Chief Brecken. They bought two new replacement trucks, two-way radios, reduced the 70-hour work week to 56 hours. The 1960s, they saw the workload nearly double that of the 1950s. The response calls went from 450 average in the 50s to uh, well over 1,000 in the 60s, early 60s. Uh, Education for the firefighters on dangers of new plastic building materials. So fighting fires all of a sudden started changing. There were new techniques that you had to learn. There was because of new product, building products and so forth. Their response calls included a lot more than just fires. They were going to auto accidents, drownings, emergency medical calls, plane crashes, public assistance, rescues and so forth. So it wasn't just like way, way back where they were just responding basically to, to uh, fires. Now they're responding to quite a bit more. 1960, now you saw this truck before. We uh, darkened off the background, but the large fire finally destroys the O'Connell factory. This was the O'Connell factory. And as I said earlier, this is where the Marble Savings Bank new building is today, was the, was the O'Connell factory on the corner of Howe Street and, uh, well, it's now the corner of Granger Boulevard and South Bolton, I believe that would officially probably be on the southwest corner. We finally got the two uh, big tanks built up on the, the hill that each one of these could hold two million gallons of water. This is when they first built them. There's no paint on them or anything, but when they first constructed them. The one at Sligo Hill over here and the one on top of Fairmont Hill over here. Those were the very first ones uh, that were built. Uh, 1963 found another big fire coming to our city, the Lionhurst Ballroom. I remember that Paul was telling me some stories about he was fighting, I think he was trying to go up to the door and all of a sudden whoosh, blew him back, it exploded, the fire exploded like you can see how violent a fire was. I remember going to watch it. It was uh, in the winter times. you can see the snow here, very, very cold. Uh, you want to say, I know, tell some of the things you were telling me about that fire, Paul. Well, it's a, I was on the call department then, and we took a line, uh, an inch and a half, it's like, like a garden hose to something like that, and it, we happened to open the door and look in, and here comes the fire rolling across a huge open space, 
and threw the doors open, knocked both myself and one of the other callmen down. He entered the hospital, he got hurt. And of course, in the excitement, he turned the nozzle on. And of course, now the hose is just spinning all over the place. And I don't know if you can see it, there's iron railings on, coming down the yeah, front steps. Right here. And it, luckily, it hooked right under there and stopped flying around. And um, it, it was almost impossible to fight it. it. It had gotten such a head start on it. And it went from that picture to that one in no time. It was just protect the surrounding areas is, is all you could really do. Now, where was this? That's uh, you right know across where, from where the courthouse right is now. Right where the courthouse is, there's an apartment complex. Right there with the apartment complexes. That was built in 1922, and it was used for various things. I had my... Uh, senior prom there, I remember going, I think it was senior prom, or whatever it was. But they, uh, they had, uh, used to have all the big bands of the time, like uh, uh, Tommy Daw Daw Jimmy Dorsey, Tom uh, I'm trying to remember some of the names. Yeah, we have going, a lot of information upstairs We have a ton it. of information upstairs. All big bands played there, uh, wrestling matches there, boxing matches there, roller skating there. A lot of fun memories for a lot of uh, people. Killer Kowalski fought Killer there. Killer Kowalski fought there. <laughs> Yeah, so. They didn't rebuild? Our class no, president graduated uh, seventh and eighth grade graduation. Was held there. <laughs> <laughs> it was a fun place to go to. Go roller skating, dancing there. They had all kinds of things happening there. Everybody was sad when the Lionhurst burnt down to the ground. It was the people that owned it at the end was the Colliani family. They were a great family. A lot of people knew them. They were very uh, well liked in the city. And, uh, they were they were very 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 sad. And Pat Colliani uh, was a big volunteer when I was head of Marble Cultural Affairs for us, and uh, she was uh, took her years to get over that fire. She used to talk about it all the time. It was very very sad. But um, so, anyways, it's like they say, it's an apartment project there now. 1965 work week got reduced from 56 hours down to 42 hours. How many hours is it now? 42? Okay, so since 1965 it's been 42. Uh, the farm stand, Rice's Orchard, was destroyed in a fire that year. Uh, any of you probably, as I say, old time marble people will remember the Rice Orchard's uh, farm stand down on. That's where uh, Wendy's. Wendy's, I, I was going to say Arby's. Wendy's was located down on Route 20 West. 1965, the Wheel of Dart Express Shed on Florence Street went up in flames. You would tell me about this one too, something about that, the roof. Uh, yeah, the roof, it was a slate roof and that kind of held the fire in. It had, if you can notice it, it's having a hard time getting out. Right and here. that's all slate, so um, once it finally got out the end of the building, Jeez, uh, flames coming up the, here. we had another line on the other side and I remember being on, on the north side and they're shooting the water through and they're blowing the slate shingles off, hitting you needed a helmet that day, let me tell you. It's, it's, it looks like it was boarded up anyway, was it not? It, it was, yeah, yeah it, had, it was a freight house because the tracks, the train tracks were just to this side of it. They um, used to be, see these train, you can barely see it, the train tracks, there used to be a two-story building here and the train used to come up. Uh, go inside. Come up. No, uh, that's the one right behind it. it behind it, yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. behind it there. The, uh, Train come up what we know is South Bolton, but there was train tracks that came up where South Bolton Street is, and it, it was off of Maple Street. And it would come right up there, and it'd go up a grade like up two levels. And it would stop up there and dump coal out and things like that. And one day the train came, and they couldn't stop, and they ended up down on Florence Street. This was many, many years ago. Yeah. Many, many years ago. We have pictures of that, uh, that, that accident. In 1966, uh, Chief Reckon retires. They bought a new pumper truck. You can tell look at how much the budget's gone up. $242,000, including $220,000 in salaries. Well, now you've got more full-time full fire, firefighters and not just all call firefighters. That year, they responded to 1,034 calls. Those weren't all fires. Those were all kinds of different other things, too, I'm sure. 1967, the firefighters formed their union with the International Association of Firefighters, chartered as Local 1714. You'll see their logo at the very end here. I'll show it to you when we're done. But uh, 
That's when uh, August 28, 1967, when they formed their union. An arsonist was caught that year after setting seven fires. I think he went to jail. Did he, Paul? He went to jail, didn't he? This arsonist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They caught him. Do you remember what the fires were that he set? Any? Uh, of them? he set the library and the St. Jean's Block, oh. and he did a small one across the street from there, which was a. At one time, it was um, Crystal's Driving School, and then they oh, moved yeah. down to West Main Street and Crescent, and he set that one too. But they did catch him. He, I mean, he was, and he was a tall kid, and he could set the fire and be on the other end of town before anybody even called. He was Jeez. amazing. But they, he did get caught because somebody actually saw him doing it. Yeah. I remember, I remember those different ones. Yeah, that's the year I got appointed onto the fire department permanent. Didn't he set the one? 67. 67. Didn't they, uh, you said St. Jean's, wasn't it the building across the street from the, uh, what's the? Norman Block? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he did because that one I also. I, my wife Joanne's up sitting over here. We were across the street from that fire and there was someone up on the ladder and the, the ladder, the rung, Fell down oh, yeah. and caught, caught his, got his feet stuck, and he was screaming. I can't remember who that was. Danny Manning. Danny, okay, that's who it was. He had his feet stuck between the rungs, and he was screaming, screaming terribly. It was uh, uh, Joanne had an uncle that was a fireman. She was nervous, and we also knew you had just started. Yeah. So we were thinking the worst. And caught a block which was on the corner of Bolt of uh, Bolt, on Lincoln, Lincoln and Mechanic. Mechanic. <laughs> uh, top two floors were burnt off. This building's still there today. It still sits oh, there. This is Mechanic Street here and this is Lincoln Street here. Mm -hmm. This has been bars for a time. The old Oxford Cafe was in here at one time many years ago. Burt's Lounge, I think, was in here. Yeah, I'm Bert's. trying to remember. There's been so many different That's ones the one in there. That's painted green now? Yeah. I think yeah. it is, but uh, yeah, exactly. I think... Yeah, I think yeah. Jerry Dumas bought it, yeah, and he he has used furniture store in there. I think there was a I think a Mexican restaurant or some type of restaurant yeah, in there yeah. for a while. They, there's been two or three of them, but they can never make it in there. They don't have any parking. They, yeah, that's, that's one high. of their problems. Yeah, no parking. Big problems, no parking. And it must have been owned by Louis B. Because look on the side here, B.B. Realty. <laughs> a lot of us know Louis B. B. <laughs> so yeah. I think it was owned by him. Paul, uh, when we were looking at this picture, thought that was him up there, but I said, you didn't have enough guts to go up that high. <laughs> what are you talking thing. about? No, <laughs> I'm only kidding. I was always we on give the each lab. other the business yeah. all the time. Yeah. Uh, but we, he, didn't re he couldn't remember who the two guys were up there, but that's up there quite a ways, I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, that was, I remember that fire, too. That was quite a fire. 1968, Bill McCarthy takes over as the chief in 1969. He retired. He was a captain at the time that he took over. In the 70s, saw the trend to yellow trucks. That was my truck, yeah. I drove that one. So, uh, in many hours of training firefighters in handling new life-threatening hazards such as toxic gases. So you can see, as time progresses, it, that the plastics, now toxic gases, and you're going to hear more as we move on here. They, they also had self-contained breathing apparatus introduced to them during the 70s. This is one of the new yellow pumpers here. That, during the 70s, <coughs> excuse me, they also added 24 <coughs> men to the department. Uh, 1970 saw the first rescue truck with Jaws of Life purchased, uh, and the uniforms all changed back to all blue, military style. They got away from the cocky one that got uh, brought in in the 30s. They had a temporary station at Evergreen Cemetery in Wilson Street. Now, non-firefighters don't answer this. Do you know what the name of that station was? Non-firefighters. <laughs> Keep your mouth closed now. I know. No, don't. Don't say. Anybody know? It was down at the Wilson Street Cemetery. They used one of the buildings there for the, for the East Lee Fire Station until they built the new one. <clears throat> Anyways, the firefighters used to call that station Tombstone. <laughs> Let's see, there right here, temporary station at Evergreen Cemetery on Wilson Street. 1973, they did build a new station on Route 20 East. 
I'm sure all of you know where that is. You've probably driven by it many, many times. And 73 to 74, they had contract disagreements and picketed City Hall. There again, my friend Joan found these caricatures here to, to put in there. And uh, just uh, to give you an idea. 1975, there was a new ladder truck purchased, a 100-foot Mack aerial. Pleasant Street Station got a new cement floor. They're delivering the cement there. Their budget in 75 is now up to $718,000 a year. They had 44 full-time, 26 call, plus five captains. Of course, they had a chief, too. December 7th, 1975, a day that a lot of us remember. We, our family were coming back from Milford up 495. We could see the flames uh, from, from, I think, when we in, uh, just passed uh, the Mass Pike. We could see the flames coming up, and we stopped. One of the city's <coughs> largest fire destroys the Riseburg block and also the Masonic block. Remember I showed you the Fairmont building before? That's the, where the Masonic block was. Riseburg's job is outlet. So a lot of Jarbers out with Reisbergs. A lot of uh, retail establishments got burnt out from this. It was quite, uh, quite unbelievable. They were fighting, <laughs> dropping water pressure and freezing winds for that fire. It was really, really bad. I remember I was standing oh, over in Newton Street someplace. Uh, I was a town planner at the time in Hudson, and I was talking to the Hudson fire chief. Well, they, and they had Hudson. Jimmy, were you on the force then? I was. Yeah. They had Hudson. Do you remember what other towns? What's that? Do you remember what towns Framingham, called Framingham, Westboro, Westboro, Northboro. It was Hudson, quite, quite a Sunbury. few. About six, six, seven different towns come in to help fight that fire. What you couldn't see from the front side of the buildings, they were so close and there was a, a skirt built up between them that the fire, the convection of the heat went right into the Masonic block from the other building. It was only probably two feet separation in there. And we advanced the line up off of Newton Street into the building. And when we got up to the top floor, we couldn't believe that that big, huge hall up there, uh, the fire was just coming right at us like, like a flamethrower. It was amazing. Uh, 1977 saw a $75,000 major fire down at the Country Club. It didn't destroy the place, but there was a major fire down there. Uh, 1979, Chief Maroney retires. The senior captain, Herbert Thorpe, became the acting chief. 1980, Robert McCarthy appointed the chief. This is uh, Jack Kenny, I believe it is. Is that who it is? Yeah. Jack Kenny, the firefighter. And that's this was, he was captain at the time here. Uh, Bob McCarthy was the captain at the time. But he got appointed the chief in 1980. Uh, during that time, three new pieces of equipment and three smaller vehicles were purchased. Trucks changed back to traditional alert red, as we said earlier. Thirty-three new men were hired. So back in the 70s, they hired 22, I think it was, and then they hired another 33 uh, here in the 80s. 80, 85, the department integrated with the hiring of the first black firefighter. Now I think you have four. Is it four on the department? Three or four on the department? Uh, the uh, 86, two firefighters died, Roger Benish and Jack Ly Lyons. Jack Lyons died, uh, he was up visiting at the Pleasant Street Station and he went across the street and he had problems with his left eye and he didn't see a car coming and he got hit by a car. Benish was on an inspection, wasn't he? No, he was, uh, uh, he was on the dive team and they were scuba diving uh, practice run up at uh, Rockport. Oh. And... Uh, Suffered a heart attack when he came back and out of the water. When he came out of the water? Wow. 1989, Chief McCarthy retired and Edward L. Bigel takes over, better known as Ski. Uh, that year also saw a major explosion at Gotham Inc. on East Main Street that killed two people. Gotham Inc. used to be a Coca-Cola bottling plant, if any of you remember that. But way back, there was a bottling plant that I remember when I was uh, young. Uh, but it killed two people. Uh, that particular explosion. They died from their uh, their injuries. Uh, they were taken. Oh. They were brought out. I brought one out, and the guy that I ride with brought the other one out. They were flash burnt 
they had no skin left on them, nothing. Ooh. there. Wow. Their employees? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. And they died from infection uh, wow. a couple of days later. Yeah. I mean, and to actually pick this guy up, uh, he had on uh, like polyester clothes and part of the clothes were still stuck to his body, but he was right down to raw meat. Just, uh, there was no skin left on him, no hair, no nothing. It, it, it was, it was sick. All right, so uh, also in 1989, how many of you remember Maple Lane's Bone Alleys? Uh, that got destroyed by fire. It was down at Route 20 West. It'd be down where, uh, other, where uh, what's that, Starbucks and Boston, Boston, Market, Boston Market is, right around there. 1990, uh, eight new men got added. Uh, bringing the permanent force to 74 permanent firefighters, including paramedics, scuba divers, you can see how much this is changing, hazarded material technicians, fire prevention officers, auto extrication personnel, and high angle rescue team. So you can see how much they've changed in what they've had to do. Uh, we did it all. We did it all. In the early 1990s, the fire alarm office merged with police dispatch and became the Marble Emergency Communication Center. Station 2 on Pleasant Street and Station 3 on Boston Pulse Road were renovated that same time in the early 90s. This was, I believe, in the old firehouse on Main Street. Paul, is that correct? Yeah, this that's picture? What it looks like it. The dispatch. And we're almost at the end. Yeah, 1995, the department consisted of a chief engineer, that's the fire chief, Four deputy chiefs, four captains, eight lieutenants, 55 firefighters working in four groups. Department operated with three frontline engines, two reserve engines, two aerials, one rescue, and eight support vehicles. 1995, they moved out of 91 Main Street down into the new station on 215 Maple Street. You can see Paul's truck here with the torrent on the back. Right that was here. a front line piece. That was one of his front line pieces. <laughs> He's bringing back new equipment to the station. <laughs> Actually, he had it housed in here for uh, how many years did you have it on I display? just one year, and one the, year? the dry heat uh, was, uh, damaged the, the wood on it. It, it shrunk it up. So and you had to pull it out. Had to take it out, yeah. So uh, 1996 to 2013, Ski Bigel left the department and was succeeded by John Kyle, who served as chief for 10 years. When he retired, David Adams became the chief and served for five years. After Chief Adams retired, Rick Plummer, a resident of Maine, was hired. Chief Plummer resigned after one and a half years and was replaced by Jim Fortin, a lifelong resident member of the department since 1988, who's still chief, but I understand he's retiring at the end of the year, if I remember right. And, uh, 1996 to 2013, Laura Stein was appointed as the first female firefighter. The department presently, this is as of the end of 2013, has four female firefighters. Anybody know if that's correct? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Between 1996 and 2013, the changes in the apparatus fleet uh, found, saw all three frontline pumpers replaced, two ladder trucks replaced, rescue truck replaced, a new inflatable boat they bought. Department's radio communication system upgraded, new radio frequencies put in, each fire officer issued his own radio frequency and so forth. Uh, same time frame, the MWRA tunnel project presented new challenges. Does anybody know where that, everybody know where that is? In the southern part, southwestern part of the city, right on the uh, Southboro line, Southboro or Northboro? Southboro, Northboro, yeah. Northboro yeah. North line, down by where Ken's food is. Uh, right there, that road that goes in, you go keep going down, you come to the, the where the tunnel, uh, tunnel, which is how many feet down is that tunnel? It's, uh, it's quite deep. Hundreds yeah. of feet yeah. down. So with the with the funding from the MWRA, the firefighters received special training in confined spaces and trench rescue training. Plus, the department was able to purchase an air supply truck. So the MWRA gave grant money to do that uh, in case they they had to go down there to respond to an emergency. Uh, in 1999, there was a five alarm fire at Wayside Condominiums, which is located on Route 20 East, down by... Across from Home Depot. Home Depot, yeah, across from Home Depot. Uh, also in 2009, they had a 
tremendous ice storm, a December ice storm, and they had to respond to 156 calls within 24 hours. So they had a very busy day from that ice storm. 2010 uh, was the major fire downtown, the major fire and building collapse on Main Street building that housed the uh, Brazilian restaurant in here, if you, you could probably remember it by that. Uh, this was a very old historic building for downtown. Uh, and uh, it was uh, people from the 50s, 60s would remember Marcharelli Jewelry used to be in here, this building here. Uh, you can see uh, Jim Ash from the Main Street Journal gave us this picture. It just so happened there was some guy flying by. <laughs> and he took a bunch of aerial shots of it. And uh, he sold them to Jim Ash at the Main Street Journal. And he let us use this picture here. So that kind of gives you a pretty good idea where this was located and everything and the scope of you know, the fire and everything. Paul was telling me that he was, uh, whoops, wrong one. He was in the back, back here. There's stairs over here, if you, people remember right. Uh, Bully Insurance Building used to be, it was on the side over there. Uh, and uh, uh, this was, uh, as I say, it was a very, this building goes back to the 1800s. It was kind of sad for historic people to see it go down. But also in 2011, there was a terrible snowstorm during, at Halloween uh, that created a lot of havoc, I guess. 2012 saw a six alarm fire. People might remember this one right across from Hunt's Mobile. See the mobile sign here uh, that, that burnt down. They're rebuilding it now. Uh, they got a, quite a bit of it up. Uh, so they just put up all the wood sides and everything on it. Uh, they were other two or three other uh, company uh, towns that we, that came in to aid. I don't know how many they were, but there was quite a few of them. They all would all would aerial with a lot of trucks. Uh, look at you can see how high up they are here fighting. This was probably that same guy. Uh, but uh, were you fighting at that one, Jim? Yeah. So that was a total, if I remember right, wasn't it? Yeah. 2013, uh, the big fire of the year was a two-alarm fire of 10 Lacature Court, which was up on the hill, up on what we call French Hill. This is the present organizational structure and shift coverage. They have one chief, one administrative assistant, four deputy chiefs, four captains, eight lieutenants, 60 firefighters. You can see it's broken down into four different groups. Group one, two, three, and four here. Deputy, you know, headquarters, the captain, lieutenants, and then the 15 firefighters in each one, so forth here. And uh, uh, mobile fire structure, the department operates 24 hours a day, utilizing four groups of firefighters, with each group working two 10-hour days, followed by two 14-hour nights, and then four days off before repeating the eight-day cycle. We maintain a minimum staffing of 10 firefighters, two lieutenants and one captain per shift to staff the city's three fire stations. Also in a complement of three frontline pumpers, one ladder truck, one rescue truck. Each piece of apparatus is manned with two firefighters and pumpers are also staffed with an officer. When increased staffing permits, a second ladder truck is placed in service. During simultaneous incidents, or those requiring additional equipment or manpower, the department recalls off-duty manpower by use of a pager system. So this is how your, your fire department operates today. And <coughs> from 2008 to 2013, the department responded to an average of 6,000 calls per year. Now, if you remember when I started off, it was two, two, <laughs> two. <laughs> So you can see what's happened over all these years since uh, 1855 up to 2013. The challenges facing the Marble Fire Department are varied, ranging from what we call smells and bells to hazmats, potential terrorism, and everything in between. So they re have to deal with a lot more different things today than they had in 1855. They just responded to fires basically in 1855. The men and women of the Marble Fire Department face these challenges 24-7, 365 days, and they still make house calls. <laughs> <laughs> and here's uh, Paul. 
uh, with Adrian Temple when they first got the torrent. This is up at your house, isn't it? Tom? Yeah. And they, they, before they even started to restore it. And uh, we wanted to just show that in recognition of Paul for all the help he gave us in putting this together here tonight. Uh, so I could say here, 130 years later, torrent number one returns to Marlboro. And, uh, you know, we want to thank Paul for sharing his photographs, his knowledge of the history of the Marlboro Fire Department from its beginning to 1990. Uh, we also want to wish, wish to thank Deputy Chief Ron Ayotte for providing the Society with the history from 1990 to the present. These are uh, some of uh, badges from Paul's collection. And uh, as I said, here's the logo of the local uh, 1714, the Marvel Firefighters, International Association of Firefighters, and we thank you for coming. Thank you very much.